if you're a good tracker you're also going to find anti-tracking comes quite naturally to you because the principles that we employ when we track a person or an animal in the bush is also what we can do to avoid being tracked ourselves now if you find yourself in an escape and evade situation these principles are really going to help you to ensure that you put distance between yourself and whatever threat you're moving away from and now I am actually following the tracking party. They may be expecting you to do what you're planning to do as well. Just remember, we're thinking about the psychology of a person who is trying to find you. So I'm going to share some of the anti-tracking principles in Escape and Evade with you in this video. I'm Clarice, welcome to the Live Ready channel. So interestingly enough, when I was making my way down to the river here, I was keeping an eye on where I was placing footprints, thinking that I would film my own footprints and show you a bit of the anti-tracking principles based on my own footprints. And I came across another set of tracks, which I was quite surprised to actually have found here because I am at the moment so far off of any other trail. Um, so I really would not have expected to find tracks here quite interesting um, these tracks are a couple of days old and obviously this person was not employing any anti-tracking um, uh, principles or they were not trying to not be found but it is quite interesting that there was someone around here and in tracking this person I can also start to read the story of what they were doing here in the camera frame you should actually be able to see there are toe prints just around there somewhere where this person came to the water and then this mark over here is where they've left the water again and so this tells me that they came fetched water left again um, there wasn't a large disturbance here they didn't spend a lot of time here they literally just came to the water quite quickly and there was only one person present and as i can read the story from just these two tracks that i found here now there's a couple other ones over there that i went and had a look at in the very same way if somebody is trying to track you and you're trying to avoid them they're going to read the story of the sign that you leave behind and then we're not just talking about tracks here we're talking about the six things that we look for when we are tracking it's those very six things that you need to try to not leave behind if you want to employ anti-tracking methods so those six things that we look at for tracking is disturbance so anything that for example is turned over um, this can be a branch of a tree. I found a tree earlier that's actually been pushed over. It looks like it was pushed over by an animal. Um, so it's gonna be disturbance, it's gonna be discoloration. So if I, for example, took the sand and I scraped it, there's a darker patch on the sand here now, and that discoloration is gonna tell me that there's a disturbance in that area. Flattening and regularity are the other things that we can have a look out for. That was the last thing. What else do I look for if I'm tracking stuff? Transference and things that get discarded as well. So anything that gets left behind that's not um, a natural part of that environment is going to give you an indication that there has been activity in that area. And if you're employing anti-tracking methods, it's exactly those things that you want to avoid. And discoloration can also come in the glare that you get off of a track. So make no mistake, even if you are on rocky ground if you manage to just flatten the soil or the ground or the rocks to the point where they have a slight sheen um, you can start to see that there has been somebody that passed by that we need to go through a mindset shift in order to get to anti-tracking so what are they going to look for what must i not leave behind is what should be going through your mind all the time i'm sitting here with some of the tracks that i made walking in towards the river and um, you can see that I wasn't taking any sort of care to conceal my tracks here. Now, like I said, it's not just tracks that we're looking for. We're looking for sign, basically spur, spur being tracks and sign. Um, so it's going to be the tracks that I leave in the ground, the imprints from a tripod, um, the branches from a tree that are broken, um, anything that I've discarded along the way. 
uh, if someone has, for example, stopped and urinated somewhere along the way, that sign is also going to be part of the spur that they leave. And you need to be considerate of these kinds of things when you are being tracked. This is me going forward at a relative pace. I'm carrying a bag, so you're going to see that the prints of a person who carries a bag or something heavy whether it be on the one side whether it be a balanced weight um, or whether it be something that they're carrying in their hand or walking with because that might have looked like a walking stick if you missed the other two feet of the tripod um, is going to all determine what that print looks like and your print when you're trying to hide it is also going to tell that story um, what I want to show here is that when I'm walking forward at a moderate pace um, you can see that the indentation my toe leaves is much deeper than what my heel leaves and this is important when you start to employ some of the anti-tracking methods because if you start backtracking um, or for example walking backwards then what can happen is your heel leaves a deeper imprint or an indentation so knowing what the track should look like going forward is going to help you to employ the anti-tracking part of that if I'm going to backtrack on that and I'm going to do a natural walking backwards from here just I actually sank in completely here um, so you can see also because I'm off balance and I'm on on a slope here what happens is my indentation of my heel is much deeper if I'm walking backwards than if I'm walking forward. The other thing that trackers will look for is a toe out angle. So if I'm looking over my shoulder going backwards, my toe is going to go out a little bit more because I'm turning to look over my shoulder to see where I'm going. And it is a telltale sign to trackers. So if I were to backtrack very carefully, I need to try and leave a deeper indentation with my toe than with my heel. And even so, you can still see the difference in the prints. So that's backtracking, but it's not the only method that we can employ to try and throw someone off of our trail. If skills like tracking or survival or preparedness is something that you're interested in learning, go and check out the Live Ready website. I do run survival preparedness courses. You can mail me at info at liveready.co.za to book a course. Strange feeling of being watched. The terrain that you're crossing and what the environment looks like is very much going to determine what kind of method you employ in anti-tracking. So on soft sand like this, and you can see how quickly these tracks are aging in the soft sand and with the wind, um, these are going to deteriorate very quickly. And so it's quite easy for me to try and brush over my tracks here because whatever brush marks I leave um, from the foliage that I use is also going to deteriorate very quickly. Whereas if I'm crossing rocky terrain, it might be a whole lot easier for me to employ backtracking. As you can see, backtracking here isn't a very good method to use. And then you must also consider that if you are going to brush over your tracks or to try and remove them, what you use in order to do that is also going to leave a sign. Um, so it's going to hide some of the details of your tracks and it's going to hide some of the story, but it's still going to leave a story and it's still going to leave a sign that you were there. Now I've taken these two branches, I'll show you the difference. So the finer and the more dense the foliage is um, and the less hard twigs there are in it, the less sign or track it's actually going to leave. So if I brush with this one, you can see there are some marks that get left in the sand. Whereas if I have something like this, um, it leaves a whole lot less of a mark in the sand. And I can quite easily use this to brush my tracks out there. And within an hour, there's going to be almost no sign here at all, except for the fact that I've broken these two branches off. So somewhere in the environment here, there's still going to be an indication that a person or something was around and broke branches off. Um, so consider where you break your branches off as well, if you are going to wrap your tracks out so that it isn't the most obvious thing to find. You can actually 
get away with um, breaking branches off in, in quite well concealed places as well. Remember that everything you touch captures your scent and the less you touch um, the more your scent is dissipated by the wind and by the sun. Now how fast you employ anti-tracking methods is also going to depend on how much time you actually have. If you're being pursued by a party that has for example dogs, those dogs are going to move a whole lot faster than what a tracker can move by himself and so then you're going to start employing a whole bunch of different tactics in order to put this between yourself and the search party. When it comes to evading dogs, you can actually also tire the handler and use like the wind for example to blow your scent into areas where it becomes difficult for the dogs to track you. Um, or you can leave scent in areas that would confuse the dogs or that makes it difficult for the handler to move through that environment. So if you leave more robust circular trail for the dog to follow and then get confused by deliberately leading the dog on a well-marked circle, Breaking off a different point before returning to that circular route can actually win you some time. Now remember, a trained dog is definitely going to follow its nose rather than its eyes and its ears. Mud can reduce your scent um, and if you're exhausted, just float down river um, because the water also will dissipate your scent and it's really difficult to, to track by scent and water. Or to create distrust between the dog and the handler by confusing the dog or making the handler think that the dog is confused. Now I really like dogs, don't get me wrong, but they are still an animal and the advantage that we humans have over animals is intelligence so you can outwit an animal that is put onto your scent if you're trying to throw a dog off your scent for example um, moving through an area that has a whole lot of um, sensory overload where there is for example overwhelming natural smell so a freshly plowed field or a place where there is a lot of manure or moving through water um, because water dissipates your scent as well and it can confuse that animal. You can also leave decoys for a dog so if you're going through the bush um, perhaps you are sweating quite a lot because the faster you move the more you sweat the more of a scent you have. If you take your base layer off and you leave your base layer somewhere the dog might actually be attracted to your base layer more than what they are actually attracted to you and that can buy you some time. You can also use a body of water or moving through a body of water to mask your scent, um, hide your tracks or any other sign that you would leave otherwise and you can actually travel quite quickly if you're going down river so that can also help you to buy a bit of time for yourself. Often a body of water can also pose an obstacle to a dog and a handler or to a big search party um, that would cause the search party to kind of have to go around the obstacle rather than to have to go through the obstacle so for example um, a cliff, a river, a dam, all of those are obstacles that would cause the dogs and the handlers to have to go around or depending on what the search party is all carrying with them um, could buy you some time if you're able to scale the obstacle a lot faster than the search party. There are some other methods that you can employ in order to confuse someone who is on your track. So if you are actually leaving tracks where you're going, abrupt changes in direction direction or even moving forward and then backtracking and then changing direction um, all of those can be things that you do but you have to be really deliberate about how you do it it can't just be a willy-nilly change of direction so for example if I was going to leave a print here where I'm standing um, but I wanted to change direction instead of just putting my foot down beside me I would opt into the bushes because it's going to leave less of a track um, but that in and by itself is also going to leave an imprint in the bush because where you step on plants and where you step on foliage that foliage gets depressed so you would have to um, lift the foliage up and also hide it. Just stepping on grass for example is going to flatten the grass and leave that shine which you'll see in the sunlight. Um, it also leaves a depression and you can sometimes leave sand or debris behind on top of that grass and that can also be an indication that the grass has been stepped on. So where I'm standing now in the moist soil I'm obviously picking up a lot of that moist soil and I'm going to transfer that moist soil elsewhere. Another way that you can track a person is by noticing the specifics of their feet, their shoes um, and their gait as well. 
Now when I make an abrupt change in direction, once again the movement of my foot and the transference of my weight is going to tell the tracker exactly what I was doing. So for example, if I'm walking in a direction here and I now want to make an abrupt change in direction, let's say there's a bit of foliage around, um, my print isn't so clear and I'm hoping that the tracker is going to continue on this line especially if I've left a long straight line of tracks behind me that tracker can sort of get into the habit of just following that straight line and can become a little bit complacent in that um, and then if I do an abrupt change of direction let's say I'm going in this direction I need to make sure that when I transfer my weight I don't leave a deeper imprint um, on the medial side of my footprint so where I go there if that tracker has to backtrack and come find my print and go this is actually much more defined on the medial side maybe that's why I'm not finding another print here where would that weight transference have gone? So those are the kinds of things that you want to be careful of when you are doing abrupt changes of direction. What you can also do is to actually use something like a shamach or um, buffs or foliage or anything like that, wrap it around your foot or around your shoe um, and then walk on those because there's less of an indication of weight transfer if you have a buffer or a soft lining around your shoe or around your foot. Some of the other things you can do is to also just change your footwear somewhere through or to use um, high traffic paths. That's because using well trafficked areas can actually help to conceal your spur. So if I for example I'm up on the mountain and I know that there's a whole bunch of trail runners who use the path that I'm on, it's quite easy to blend into all of the tracks that the trail runners leave um, so that I don't end up leaving such obvious tracks myself. However, I would have to use the same pace they do to not stand out as a hiker um, among the trail runners because their pace is faster so their stride length is longer. If you are on a well trafficked site um, and you're moving in a straight direction and you are starting to train the tracker to look for certain behaviors because you're repeating your behaviors. Remember we're thinking about the psychology of a person who is trying to find you here. Um, then you can use that to your advantage. So if I for example am on a long straight path here and I know my tracker is going to pick up their pace because it looks like I'm just continuing on the straight path then I can at some point step off of my path and maybe do something like a button hook. Now what a button hook is um, if you're on a trail you at some point divert and backtrack but not on your original tracks you sort of do a loop back so that you can conceal yourself along the path and either monitor the path or set up an ambush. Okay so for example if if I were going to do a button hook, I would be on a path, on a track, whatever that track looks like. It can be winding, but I'm training the tracker to follow that trail that I'm setting. Now personally I would always do an abrupt change of direction especially if I've managed to um, create the illusion that I'm going to continue in a straight line or I'm going to continue on my track. Now I can do a quick change of direction, come off of my trail and do a button hook back around so I can sit and monitor the track that I was on originally. Now I'd obviously conceal myself, I'm being very obvious right here, um, but now I can also, once my tracker or the tracking party has passed by me, I can now slot in behind them and now I am actually following the tracking party which makes it so much harder to try and track me. Wow that is clever. Why has nobody ever said that on a YouTube video before? Also if I am now following a tracking party particularly if there are a large number of people they are going to end up leaving a whole lot of tracks themselves. So if I did a button hook around and I'm now following the tracking party my exit point is going to be that much better concealed if I exit elsewhere. So it's going to be that much more difficult for them to find me. I just need to make sure that 
my button hook loop isn't so close to where my original trail is that I end up being in their line of sight as they're coming back and I'm following them. Do you also know that tracking parties are aware of mechanisms like button hoops and they may expect you to do something like that. They may also expect you to backtrack um, or to change your shoes or to move through a body of water somewhere along the line. So don't think that you're always going to have the thinking advantage on a tracking party. They may be expecting you to do what you're planning to do as well. All this anti-tracking stuff can seem quite ominous and if you're having a hard time figuring out how it applies, the Bible actually gives us a really nice example in 1 Samuel 23 where King David, before he actually became king, was trying to escape from Saul who wanted to kill him for having been anointed as king. And it goes to show you, you don't necessarily have to have caused the trouble to be in it. Um, so you may well find yourself having to evade a search party at some point. Better to have some anti-tracking skills up your sleeve should that ever happen. Out of interest from now having sat here with my heels in the water you can see the depression that I've made here. So if you are going to enter a body of water somewhere make sure that you don't leave a very obvious entry point such as this one here um, because it can also indicate the direction in which you traveled and obviously people generally don't tend to want to stay in water for a really long time. So the assumption on the trackers part here is going to be um, if this is the entry point then the shortest route across the body of water is going to be in that direction and that's probably where they're going to start looking for you next. So if you are going to enter a body of water um, in order to employ counter tracking methods then make sure that your entry point doesn't indicate the direction in which you're going to actually travel and you can throw a tracking party off that way um, by for example entering a body of water indicating the direction that you're going to travel in and then changing your direction in the body of water because it's just about impossible um, to see a change in direction inside a body of water. Um, so if you are going to enter a body of water and exit it elsewhere, try to think about what um, your tracker is going to try and predict you doing. If you've liked this video, remember to hit like and subscribe, follow me on social media, check out the Live Ready Instagram page. I post some of the day-to-day -day Live Ready stuff on there. Remember to go and check out the Liberty website as well where I post a bit more of the information around courses and remember that you can mail me at info at liveready.ca.za to book a course. Until the next time, live ready. <laughs> That's a lot of live readies in one sentence.